So I thought I, I would talk about something maybe a little more interesting, and that's uh, how technology is covered in the media. Um, and I guess uh, I should separate those two because I kind of have different feelings about both uh, technology and media. Uh, and I think those feelings can probably be best summarized by headline. Technology good, media bad. Um, now the thing is, is that some of that bad media actually sometimes makes me angry. Uh, and being a comic book fan, I thought I would uh, uh, propose a little late addition to the headline. So I'd like to amend it. And uh, the t title of the talk today will be Technology Good, Media Bad, Hulk Smash! <laughs> so, uh, to, to explain myself a little bit more, um, I guess what I need to, uh, what I, we, we need to separate those two. We need to uh, separate technology and media. And the problem is, is that uh, technology is a good thing, and I, I, do, I firmly do believe that, and we've had thousands of years to show that technology is a good thing. But the thing is, is that over the past few decades, we've had the, the ironically, technology has led to a dramatic increase in how much media we have. And uh, what that means is that there's more media today than ever before. There's more reporting of news going on today than ever before. But the thing that hasn't increased correspondingly is journalism. And there, yes, there is a very big difference between technology and journalism. Uh, sorry, between reporting and journalism. Reporting ba basically tells you uh, what's been said, what's happened. Journalism kind of gets into the, the meat of what's happened and what's been said and tries to find the truth. So uh, those, th these two things have not grown correspondingly. One has obviously increased uh, a lot more than the other. Uh, and I know this comes as a shocker to a lot of people, but much of what you see or hear in the media is simply not true. And that's because a lot of reporters just, they don't have the time to tell you the whole story, or they'll tell you part of the story, and then, you know, more of the story happens later, but they just don't have time to go back to it, or they don't have interest, or whatever, they're onto something new, etc. There's a lot of reasons why the full story doesn't get told. <coughs> so, uh, I'll give you a bit of an example of this. Uh, in September, uh, the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism, they did a study of how uh, technology is covered by the media. And they found that the biggest single event or storyline during the year involved the perils of technology, the hazardous yet compulsive practice of texting while driving. Nearly one in 10 technology stories were about this subject, more than five times the coverage of either the US plan for broadband access and six times the coverage devoted to the debate over net neutrality. So, I don't know about anybody else, but I have texted while driving. That's the reporting side of the story. The journalism side of the story, though, uh, which rarely gets reported, would tell you that I've also uh, drank hot, scalding hot coffee while driving. I've uh, sung along to the radio loudly. I've had conversations with passengers. I've cut my fingernails. I've fiddled with CDs. I've plucked my eyebrow hairs. I've fished for loose change. All these things, sometimes all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's not something that we usually hear about because these are all things that we've been doing for, for ages. Uh, and, you know, they're kind of old hat. Texting, though, is relatively new and it's technological. So the irony is that, therefore, it must be feared. So how do we get here? Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of strange that apparently, you know, if you, if you read the news, texting is apparently the most perilous thing you can do while you're driving. So how do we get to this point? Well, uh, by a show of hands, how many people here remember this cartoon? Wow, okay, that's a lie. I wasn't expecting that many. The Jetsons was a, was a cartoon in the 60s. <coughs> it was a cartoon in the 1960s, and it was about a family that lived in the future in the year 2062. And uh, basically, it was a time when everybody was booting around in flying cars, and they had robot maids uh, cleaning their houses and catering to their every whim. Um, and it was pretty much a, a story of a technological utopia. And the, um, the thing... The, the, the jokes in the show basically were based on, uh, you know, the, the, the jokes were centered around some of the, the remaining trivial inconveniences that they still had. So in one episode, George Jetson, the main character, he, uh, he was sitting there at his desk pushing his button at his job, and he said the following, Boy, this job's a killer. I spend an hour a day, two days a week, working my fingers to the bone. Well, that's a, that's a work schedule I wish I had. I wish I could work one, one, what is it, one hour a day, two days a week. That would be fantastic. Um, the cartoon was actually a reflection of the times. Uh, in 1961, President Kennedy, he made a, his historic promise that uh, he was going to, that an American was going to set foot on the moon. 
And uh, that pretty much kicked uh, the space race with the Soviet Union off into high gear. And the Jetsons uh, debuted a year later. And it, now the 60s was a, was a difficult time to be alive. I was obviously too young, and I think most people here were probably too young too. It was a difficult time to be alive because there was the ongoing threat of nuclear war, nuclear annihilation. Um, but the thing is, I think that also made people ki kind of hopeful about the future and kind of optimistic about technology. So I think that they looked at the space race and, th and thought, hey, this could actually lead to the Jetsons. So uh, 1969, man did indeed set foot on the moon. And yes, it was an American, unless it was a big Stanley Kubrick conspiracy, but you know, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, things were good for a while, but then a lot of te uh, successive technological catastrophes happened. Uh, so you had, of course, the ongoing threat of nuclear war. You had the birth of the environmental movement when people realized that all these chemicals and all this plastic may not actually be good for us. Maybe it's harming us. Then later on, you had the space shuttle Challenger explosion. You had mad cow disease and so on and so on. So what, is, what this has done is it's made people in the media, therefore, over the course of decades, somewhat skeptical about technology. Outside of technological circles, the same thing has happened. Uh, so you had things like Watergate in the 70s, uh, and more recently you had the Iraq War, where people have become really doubtful about what they're hearing, what they're being told. So where that's brought us is to the present day, and it's brought us to Wally. -E. <coughs> now Wally, -E, two years ago, uh, was of course uh, an Oscar-nominated movie from Pixar about the trash compactor robot that finds love and all those great things. Um, but in the movie, humans are portrayed as, you know, these uh, just enormous blobs that are incapable of even walking without the help of, uh, you know, some sort of flying chairs. And while Wally -E was a great movie, I think it did present a very cynical view of technology and of the future. And I think that's a very massive, massive shift in attitude from the Jetsons. Um, and that's actually kind of too bad because I think for, in the, for the most part, the Jetsons got it right. Uh, today, we, we're not flying around in flying cars and we don't have robot maids, but we do have robots cleaning our floors and we do have robot cars driving on highway, it's true. Um, so we're not quite at the Jetsons yet, but the Jetsons was in 2062. We have 50 more years to get there. We're well on our way to getting there and it's gonna happen. So how do you quantify a statement like technology is good? Some people say it's impossible to do. I think it's actually very easy. All you have to do is look at some very basic statistics. Um, it's been said that life centuries ago was nasty, brutish, and short. And it's true if you think about it. A thousand years ago, the life you could look forward to was basically uh, a lifetime of backbreaking physical labor. Uh, your children may not survive past the uh, first few months of their life. The king's men would come and take all of your livestock and all of your grain and whatever and maybe even recruit you for some suicidal crusade uh, somewhere on the other side of the world. You might eat dandelions and tree bark. That might be your daily diet. And then at the end of it all, you might have the black death to look forward to. Awesome. So that's not the case in, their, in, in most of the world anymore. And if you just look at some of the numbers, um, let's look at war first of all. <coughs> technology, all of these improvements actually have, are direct results of technology. The, the, the face of war has been changed dramatically. It's no longer a case of major nation versus major nation. So in World War II, you had 78 million people die. That's just inconceivable. Today, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the best estimates have somewhere around 900,000 people dying. And of course, any war death is, uh, is terrible. But uh, the, if you look at the, just the, the, the dramatic reduction, I think that's a positive step forward. Um, some people think that the United States is eventually going to go, with China, uh, go to war with China, and I don't think that's ever possibly going to happen because of how technology has uh, caused the economies of major countries to become so interrelated. So if the U.S. were to go to war with China, the flow of goods worldwide would stop dead. Americans wouldn't even have clean underwear to fight the Chinese in. So while there are opponents of globalization for many reasons, the reduction of war, the, the reduction of mass scale war is certainly one positive of globalization. Um, so as you can see, the numbers are down as well in other measures like poverty and mortality. Um, lifespans, here in Canada, we live 10 years longer today than we did in 1950. Over uh, a longer period of time, the differences are even more dramatic. 
So <coughs> I'm going to skip over a couple of slides here in a minute. Um, the, now, so what, what's happened here is that better transportation, better communication, better production capability, medicine, better food, all these things that are driven, that, are, that technology improves, all of these things have contributed to improving these basic measures of, of, of the human condition of life. So things are, are, you know, if you believe the media, the media would tell you that we're on the verge of an apocalypse, but in actuality, we're actually winning the war against the four horsemen. So some people underplay all of these basic improvements, which I have a serious problem with because how can you underplay them? Uh, you know, you, you can say that technology solves some problems, but it creates other problems, and that's true. Uh, and then, of course, the answer there becomes more technology. So uh, global warming is a, is a, is a good example. Uh, a lot of our technology, our, our industrialization, and all that stuff has uh, basically caused this global warming problem. Um, I myself am I'm fairly confident that I'm not too worried about global warming because I think it's something that we'll solve, we'll fix it, we'll reverse it. Uh, maybe it sounds optimistic or naive to say that, but our track record so far is pretty good. So things have kind of become so good that it's, I find it really funny when I watch TV and I think, I watch, I watch the news and I watch for things that the media is scaring us with. And the latest thing is bed bugs. Oh my God, look out for those horrible deadly bed bugs. I mean, really, if, are things so good that that's the only thing they have left to scare us with? So that brings us to the media, and these are the slides I'm going to skip. Those are from my uh, telecommunications regulation speech, which I can give it another time if you're interested. Um, there's an old adage that sex sells, and that may be true, but I think there's actually a much more powerful marketing force at play, and that's fear. <clears throat> um, one area where there's a lot of fear now, and there has been some fear for the last 10 years at least, is in uh, genetically modified foods. So there's a company in Boston called Aquabounty, and uh, they've got this fish, a salmon, where they've inserted genes from another fish, and uh, the f uh, so this salmon can actually grow twice as fast as regular salmon. So this is a picture of it. Uh, that's a regular salmon in front. These, are, these two fish are the exact same age. So as you can see, it's pretty dramatic. Um, now the media ever in search of clever sound bites has, has called this fish the Frankenfish, and uh, there's been basically every doubt conceivable tossed at this thing. Uh, you know, is it harmful for human consumption? Is it harmful to the environment? Will it contaminate uh, other species? Uh, how much water does it use? How much oxygen does it use? Et cetera, et cetera. To the point where this fish is now the most studied fish in history, we probably know more about this organism than any other organism on a cellular level than any other animal, plant, any species on Earth. So the only reason it's, being, it's close to, to being approved by regulators now is because the critics have actually run out of uh, uh, objections to throw at it. Not that they're not, still not trying. The latest one is that, uh, what if this thing, because it's seafood, what if it's more allergenic to humans? And I th I'm not a scientist, but I think that's a pretty silly uh, doubt because it's, it would seem to me that it's about as allergenic as eating one fish after another. I mean, it's just genes. We eat, we eat millions and millions of genes every single day. So uh, the benefits, though, the benefits of this fish are not well understood and certainly not real, well reported. Um, the, world's foods, uh, the world's population is expected to double over the next few decades, and the oceans are already overfished. So the benefit that this fish gives us, of course, is more food supply. And it's actually an environmentalist best friend because it makes a financial case for land-based fish farms, which if we can uh, produce more fish in land-based fish farms, that takes a lot of pressure off the oceans and therefore natural stocks of fish. So the environmentalists are starting to realize this. And just last month, um, a well-known American environmentalist, Stuart Brand, said the following. He said, environmentalists did harm by being ignorant and ideological and unwilling to change their minds based on actual evidence. As a result, we have done harm and I regret it. So it's good to see that things are changing there. <laughs> but another area where there's a considerable amount of fear is in robots and artificial intelligence. And, and somebody was talking about that earlier. It was interesting because he was saying that uh, AI was first um, introduced in uh, the 50s, which kind of makes my point in that uh, we're afraid of robots largely because of uh, one person, uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger. Because whenever, whenever somebody thinks of robots, they think the Terminator. Oh my God, they're gonna turn on us, they're gonna kill us and slaughter us and come after Sarah Connor, oh my God. Oh. Um, <laughs> never mind that in the second movie, he was actually a good guy, but that's ne never, it's notwithstanding. Um, 
what's misunderstood about robots is that uh, radical new technologies don't just appear wholesale. They, just, they don't just appear out of thin air. They come in very slowly, piece by piece, over decades. And the car is a perfect example. Uh, today's cars, uh, well, not even today's cars, cars from 10, 20 years ago had things like cruise control. Today's cars have collision detectors in the rear, so if you're backing up, it'll tell you to stop. They have lane sensors on the side, so if you're swerving lanes, you know, wake up uh, or stop plucking your eyebrows. Um, and even some of, the, some of the newer cars have laser radar, radar, in the front. That's actually what it's called. Um, that, that can tell how fast the car in front of you is going and adjust your own car's uh, speed accordingly. So our cars are slowly but surely becoming robots. Um, so much so that 10, 20 years from now, they will be driving themselves. So that's the reality of, te how te how, of how technology comes on the scene. The unfortunate thing is that reality is not all that entertaining. Um, so, and, it, and it certainly doesn't make for good headlines. So I guess to bring this all back to technology good, media bad, Hulk smash, um, what I wanted to say is that the media business is, is increasingly competitive. Like I said, there's more media today than there's ever been. So the temptation to use fear is increasing. Also, the amount of reporting is rising. The amount of journalism is not. If anything, it's shrinking. So what we need to do is we need to be very wary of this. We need to be as cynical of the, or maybe cynical is the wrong word. We need to be as uh, mindful of the media as the media is of technology. So we need to give, we need to step back maybe a little bit and disconnect and look at the world around us and realize that everything we have around us, all the comforts, all the leisures, all the benefits, much of that has been driven by technology. Um, so we don't need to give new technologies carte blanche, but we do need to think more about what are the potential benefits of these new technologies. Because right now, I think we're way too worried about the potential harm. We need to chill the hell out. So the good news is, is that the media is a very democratic business. It's possibly the most democratic business I know, possibly even more so than the government. <laughs> so if we want fear, they'll give us fear. If we want something well thought out and intelligent, that's what they'll give us too. Except maybe for Fox News, they're a lost cause. <laughs> so I guess I'll go back and retitle the talk one more time. And uh, just to summarize what I just said there, uh, I do believe that technology is good and that media is bad, but in keeping with the Hulk, thinking more good. Thank you. <laughs>